And you know, it's not every day that you see a ministry born right before your eyes. This is the first. The Lord told me to do a program called Mario Murillo Live. And I went through a long list of guests that I would have. And I said to my, I made several promises to myself, and I'm going to say this very quickly. Number one, this will be worth your time, and you should let people know what's about to happen. In the swampland of social media video, there is so much extemporaneous fluff. And I said, Lord, if I'm going to do a conversation online, live, it's got to make a difference. It's got to make sense. And I couldn't think of a more explosive subject than race and what's going on in the nation. And I couldn't think of a more important complement to that than a supernatural conversation about race. And that's what we're going to have today. And of all the guests that I went through my list and I said on the first premiere broadcast of Mario Morello Live, I'm going to have Sean Smith, an evangelist whose life is an astounding journey. You're, as I said, you're not going to regret one moment of this. And uh, Sean and I have been friends for many years, and I've watched God raise him up and use him in an extraordinary manner. And I don't give out compliments too easily, but God has used him, and his journey is the message of this hour. And so I want you to welcome Sean. It's so good to be with you, my friend. How are you doing today? Mario, man, I'm doing great. I'm super blessed and I'm excited about this show. And uh, man, I, uh, I I absolutely, man, uh, you know, just everyone is watching. Uh, Mario and I, as he said, we go back many years. This, this man has poured into my life in ministry and it's so many, it's probably uh, subject for another show, but Mario, man, has uh, literally extended his platform in favor and called people and open doors when I was starting as a, a campus pastor, fledging evangelist, and has poured into me and really helped mold me into the, the man of God I am today. So I love you, Mario. Thank you. Well, my friend, we're going to jump right into this. Thank you for that. But we're going to jump right into this. You know, let's do it. We, we've looked at race from every conceivable angle. Uh, we've had a lot of strange solutions thrown out there. But when I asked the Lord about a supernatural conversation on, gray, on race, your story immediately came to mind. And people need to beware because we're going to get brutally honest on both sides of an argument. And it, it's very important that we deal with it directly. The darkest day of your life was when you were a young child and something terrible happened. Tell the people your story, Sean. Yeah, Mario, uh, when I was nine years of age, uh, you know, there, you, you look at certain points in your life, it, it was a crater moment. I mean, something happened that left a crater. Uh, my, my dad uh, and my mom, uh, they, were, they were separated at that time, but my dad lived in San Jose, California, and I grew up in, in inner city Oakland. My dad was coming back from work one night. Uh, he worked for uh, IBM. He was a chemical engineer, educated man, extremely intelligent. And he's driving down Stevens Creek Boulevard today that's very populated then, uh, not as developed. Uh, as he's driving down the street, uh, he sees the cherry or siren go off on the top of a police car. He does what any law-abiding citizen would do, any sane person. He pulls over the side of the road. By the time they get him and, and pull him over, it's, it's not to the officer's view. There isn't populated. There, isn't, there aren't any other people around. There were two officers and a dog, and, and the story that I share is what was admitted in court. I uh, actually did re some research, and it was back in the San Jose Mercury, back, back in the day. Uh, one of the officers, uh, there's two officers and a dog, pulled my dad out of a car. Uh, the other officer to uh, report sprayed Mason in his eyes. A coroner had testified in court that had my dad live, he, he would have been blinded. Uh, they yell racial slurs at him. They demand that my dad run. Uh, he's blinded. His eyes are burning. They had a dog. They sick the dog on him. Uh, he, the dog drops him. The guys chase him down. They empty rounds in his back. These police officers, he's dead on arrival at a, at a, at a hospital. They had initially said that there was a, another story that is the officers of my dad trying to retaliate, but witnesses surfaced the same race as the police officers and gave the account that I just shared. 
it was proven in court as racially motivated. Uh, the officer that shot my dad was fired. Uh, the other officer uh, was demoted to a desk job. There was awards monies given to myself and my two half sisters that could be used for education. But as a nine year old kid, uh, you know, I'm sitting in the front row at a funeral service in Oklahoma where my dad's from. Uh, it's not just my dad that had died in that moment. You know, I'm, I'm feeling like my destiny, my world had crashed. And so it, it, it was horrific. So in the recent backdrop of George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, and, and it seems like there's a long list. Uh, I first, as a man of God, I said, oh my God, this is not gonna be good. I'm, I'm thinking kingdom and I'm thinking, man, church, we, we need to be ready, we need to be answered. Yeah. And then secondarily, uh, I was triggered a little bit, uh, you know, because of that being my story. Well, I, I want to I want to tell you something, folks. It's really remarkable. I, I mean, there, there's no justification for what happened to your dad. There's none. It, it was evil. It was racist. It was wrong. And yet, on the other hand, and we're going to get into this, uh, we also know that there are good cops. There are many, many servants, public servants, who daily risk their lives to keep us safe. So we're not going to paint a picture of all police. And I think that the tendency in conversations like ours is to be lazy and to say, well, this happened, therefore this is true. And mm -hmm. it's tragically far more complicated than that. And what I, wanted, what I want to talk about is the fact that God gave you a miracle. And in this current environment, You've been really being trained all your life for this moment. Your voice is about to come forth in a way and in a level we never thought. But in order to achieve racial justice, there's got to be some honesty in there. And so we're going to just take a moment and say we want black lives to matter. We really do. Honestly, I, I mean... And, and uh, I'm not going to even say all lives matter right now because that's a conversation for another day. But I am going to say that they matter now. But the Black Lives Matter movement, as you know, is Marxist. And they have hijacked. And, and what they're doing is they're exploiting the current tension to an end that is very damaging to the Black community. And, and I, I just want to tell you one thing they've said. They said, we're anti-family. And this is a quote from Black Lives Matter leadership. We disrupt Western prescribed nuclear family culture. And I'm going to get to something about your mom, because I think it's critical that we talk about her. In the black community and in the Latin community, and everyone needs to listen. I'm going to say this fast as I can, because I want to interview you. I am from the Latino barrio in San Francisco. You are from Oakland. We are, we, we are not Bible Belt church-raised people. We come from the epicenter of the leftist ideology of the world, or in America at least. I spent 10 years at Berkeley. You went to the University of the Pacific. So we're not coming at this from that direction. In other words, our assessment of what needs to happen with race is not a, a natural part of our upbringing. It's something God did. Isn't that right, Sean? It's absolutely correct, Mario. And, and so from broken homes, and this is Black Lives Matter wants to destroy the family, and you know that. Uh, and from broken homes, there the child is five times more likely to commit suicide, six times more likely to end up in poverty, nine times more likely to drop out of school, 10 times more likely to abuse drugs, 14 times more likely to commit rape, 20 times more likely to go to prison, and 32 times more likely to run away. But you didn't end up with that. That was not your story. You had every right to be angry and bitter and lash out and, and literally punish the men who killed your dad by destroying your own life, which is very much what I feel is going on in the inner city right now with Antifa and Black Lives Matters both. They are, they are influencing young minorities 
to be self-destructive and giving them this narrative of an ideal. But you need to tell the people what God did in you and why you're not one of these statistics. Yeah, you know, Mario, uh, after that court case and the settlement, there was awards money used for education. And so I majored uh, in, in computer engineering. And so I chose the University Pacific. It was relatively close to the Bay. So I go there, but by the time I go there, you know, all those things you said about, uh, you know, characteristics of an orphan heart, orphan spirit, that that was me. And although outwardly, you know, I, I, I appeared socially, you know, that I was balanced and, and friends and social life and doing well in school, now, internally I was imploding and, and, and it was this desperate cry. And, and it, it seemed that there came a point, and at that point in time, my grandmother, who was my primary caregiver, my, my grandma and my mom pretty much raised me, she passed and so i i hit this rock bottom place and it's a place that i don't you until you've hit it sometimes you don't recognize how dark it could be and it can happen like like this and so i i'm at a point where mario and and i know sometimes when people share their story this part sounds kind of sexy but this is legit i, I was suicidal and i don't mean that i had suicidal thoughts i i had a plan i was going to enact this plan and uh, my grandmother because i saw her Get delivered out of alcoholism at a storefront Pentecostal Holiness Church at Lake Merritt, California, uh, in, in, in Oakland, in Lake Merritt. Uh, when I saw her get delivered, it was my, like this is my junior year in high school, so I just went back for a second. Uh, it was the first time that I recognized, hey, God yeah. is real, and, and not only is God real, God can deliver, He can alter a person's life. And whatever you were before, there comes this moment where God can shift you and change you, it's supernatural, you're born again. And so my grandmothers had went to, to be with Jesus, but what God did in our life began to flash before my eyes. There were Christians on the campus that were witnessing to me. Uh, it was a predominantly uh, white or Anglo school, University of Pacific in Stockton. So one night I partied hard. I don't, I don't know, maybe that was that like prodigal son moment, but I came back and I said, okay, God, if you're real, I wanna experience you. If you let me experience you, I'll give you everything. Wow. Long story short, Jesus appeared in my room and uh, in well, that moment, well, hold on now. <laughs> Wait, you can't just say that. What? What happened? Yeah, I, I was in a dark, uh, you know, studio apartment. I cried out to God. I was awakened at three o'clock in the morning. I see Jesus tomorrow, like I see you right now, you know, via you know technology here. Uh, I I heard the audible voice of God. I know that that like uh, throws people. But proof of it is, is three decades later, I'm doing what I'm doing. And I didn't, I turned down that, that offer from Intel when they offered me a position those years ago. And, and Jesus said several things. First of all, he said to me, I'll be a father to the fatherless. Uh, we know that fatherlessness or orphan spirit yeah. spawns more immorality, more drug abuse, more violence. And, 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 and it, it's an attack at the foundation of one's character. And there's even this verse in Acts where Stephen is given a recount kind of in front of this, uh, uh, you know, uh, Sanhedrin group that, that definitely at that point in time are, are antagonistic to the gospel. And he says of, of the Israelites, he says, Pharaoh exposed the, the uh, Israelite or Hebrew fathers that they would in turn expose their children. It, it was, it's always been. And so when you're talking about this thing of, you know, Black Lives Matter, right. I agree with you. As a, as a child of God, when I read their website, and I, I say that as a child of God, there's no way I could come in agreement with that. And, and it was well said on your part because uh, the kingdom of God is, is not of this world. And so no. you can't let man's, you can't let a, a, a fallen man's agenda or worldview affect a risen king's purpose. Hey, and so it's so important. It's so important. So, hey, man. Oh, man. And so that night when I saw Jesus, first thing he said, I'll be a father to fathers. Number two. The Lord said, "You need to forgive those officers." Now you got to remember, whoa! I, no one's. I don't have. I don't. I've not had that Bible study. I've not read the Lord's Prayer, "Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us." I've not been mentored, and my mentor told me this is what you need to do. But this is what I've noticed: when you truly come in contact with the agape love of God, you're so overwhelmed with that agape love that it immediately, in a sense, wants to shoot out from you in this way of phileo love. Agape love is God kind of love. Phileo is brotherly love. And proof that you really have been impacted by the agape love of the Father is that you, you have this overflow of love. People said, was that difficult? 
to forgive him because I pictured two, my, my mom never let me go to the, the court case. I pictured two white police wow. officers, their wives, their kids. And I said, Lord, I forgive them. I pray that you'd save them. And I, I submit if I would have held on to bitterness, offense, that vitriol and, and vindictiveness, uh, there's no way that I could be in a position I'm in today. There's no way that I could be a father of two and have healthy. I, I would have been part of the statistic in that moment that was supernatural rescue for God to come down. And I, I forgave him and I immediately just felt something lift off me. And uh, it was amazing. And, and I'm with you. I, I, I salute uh, police officers that are out there that are doing their job. I've got friends and family that are part of law, law enforcement. But I, I really recognize that the real answer is that, man, we have a world that must encounter this overflow of God's love because uh, you, you're, we can't sit back and wait for the world to invent an answer to racism while we hide the best answer the world has ever seen. One thing that the late, uh, everyone, ladies and gentlemen, you don't want to think for one moment that we are diminishing the horror of what Sean Smith went through as a nine-year-old. You know, the shortest verse in the Bible is in John 11. It says, Jesus wept. And even though he was going to raise Lazarus from the dead, he still identified with the despair, the hurt, and the vileness of death and sickness. And I'm sure that even though Sean has been saved, filled with the Spirit and set free, that God's heart broke and breaks for everyone watching that has suffered injustice, whether at the hands of the police or at the hands of people that are violent, that hate the police. We also feel for the families of police officers that were assassinated merely for being a police officer. And both sides, I, I think Satan looks at it and it's like two hand puppets. One is one race, the other is another race. And he run, works both sides of the street to keep the cycle of hatred going. And so I want to tell you the, the miracle of Dr. King he wasn't a perfect man, but he understood something that I think is being buried. And he understood that a cycle of oppression, that there's an old saying that the oppressor and the oppressed, and it says the oppressed, if given enough power, will become the oppressor. And mm -hmm. that's the satanic cycle of race relations. That's why you know, I, I think we need to say this right now, and I'm getting all, I feel the power of God on me so strong, Sean. In the gospel to Sean Smith and Mario Murillo is not something we grew up with. The gospel is not an environmental factor in our thinking. The gospel of Jesus Christ was the antithesis of where we were headed when God met us in in, you know, not many evangelists have come out of the Bay Area. But here are right. two that have come out, and we came out against the grain. You know, I recognized in the inner city early on, Sean, that dependency on government was why all my, all my uncles were drunks and in debt. Mm. You know, we had the government cheese. We had the, the check. Yeah, we, had yeah. the, we had the dependency. And, and when I met Jesus... This will to succeed gripped me. And the first thing I said was, I, you know, God doesn't just get the ghetto, you out of the ghetto. He gets the ghetto out of you. And, and the thing is, is what Dr. King understood was, he said, we've got to quit talking about white power. We've got to quit talking about black power and start talking about God's power, which is where this conversation is going to head in a moment. Your ability to forgive and let it go, it, here's the way I see it. The miracle that God did in you is I'm going to let this go and move on into my blessing. And what you did is you also brought your children into that blessing. So, you know, the miracle God did in you is the miracle we need today. Yes. And uh, I want you to tell the people right now, you know, uh, we're not going to back down from race relations. We're not going to say racism doesn't exist. We're going to say, really, folks, are we going to dig up the same corpse again 
and go through another generation of making them feel uh, victimized, make them feel uh, dependent on, instead of saying, here's Jesus. Here's Jesus telling you that what was really done to you was done by the devil. And what you really need is not some leftist ideology. And Karl Marx was a racist. And let me tell you, as a Latino, if you could read what he said about Mexicans, wow. you know Marxism in a moment. But wow. but here it is, my friend. We've got a message to give America, don't we? We've got we a me- you know this this is what needs to be have been said at Chaz Chop in Minneapolis and in in the streets of New York, folks. Drop yes. all this because the same devil that made that police officer suffocate George Floyd is the same devil that's trying to put hate in your heart. So we go back and forth, back and forth, and America eats herself alive. And that's yes. why we need revival, don't we, brother? That's why we need absolutely. to move of God. Tell we them, brother. We it's absolutely need a move of God. And I, I know you know this, Mario, but at Azusa Street Revival at the turn of uh, the century, 1906 to 1909, there was a one-eyed black man, son of a sharecropper, W.J. Seymour. At the same time, there was a, a white intercessor uh, who also chronicled a lot of the stories, Frank Bartleman. And so yeah. there was a partnership between a white man and a black man and a uh, long backdrop, but to put it succinctly, uh, they saw this tremendous outpouring of the spirit. The races came together. They said it at Zuzu Street, Livery or Barn, you could see uh, African-Americans with Euro-Americans, with Asian-Americans, with Latino-Americans, with Native Americans, all on their face. Uh, in fact, Frank Bartleman is quoted as saying, it was there that he saw the color line washed away by the blood of Jesus Christ. And, and I see two extremes. I see one extreme where there's a group that wants to uh, almost to this point, not acknowledge the fact that there is an injustice that's taken place and, and maybe even struggle a little bit with saying that Black Lives Matter, which just for the record, you know, I, again, I can't speak for everyone, but I, I think if you're if you're on a street and a fire breaks out and there's you know there's a precious white family in one home, yes. a precious Latino family, another precious Asian yes. American family, if the fire is in the African American house and you're a fireman, what house are you going to go to? And I'm saying as the church, we're the firemen, and because why? If you don't Say put it. out that fire, the whole block comes Say down. It. And so Jesus would be at that house, and so we're not saying that hashtag Black Lives Matter only. We're just saying hashtag black life matter too. But the biggest thing is the reason why and I'll finish my other part of the story. This no, is no, key. You the, the reason, the reason why the civil rights thing took off is that man, the church headed that up. Dr. King, the Southern leadership, right. uh, a Christian, a Southern Baptist leadership uh, committee. Those guys were pastors that led it. And I, and I kind of can't help but feel that to a certain extent, and this is not a blanket condemnation to a certain extent, the church of North America, we, we put down the bat and quit swinging when it came to this thing of preaching the gospel, demonstrating the power, loving people who are different than us. You're doing preaching what, now, brother. What, we're doing what the, 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 cause the gospel doesn't suggest reconciliation. No. It is reconciliation. Yes. And what, what happened is Antifa and Black Lives Matter, the movement, they picked up the bat because we let it down. We got to get right. our back back up because the, the enemy can always win when the battle stays in the flesh and in the natural. And if I just get bitter and I'm gonna put white shame on you and you're gonna put this thing on me and, and all of a sudden we're, we're still on opposite ends of the street. And so to Zuzu Street, they put all that down because they had an outpouring of the spirit and it brought them together. And sadly, after three years, after three successive conflicts all over race and classism, uh, Azusa Street, in a sense, splintered and different denominations based on, uh, you know, race or form. So I just say this, the the America's last great revival ended in the midst of racism. Wouldn't it be God that if America's next great revival begins in the midst of racism? Because God pours out his spirit again and we get it right this time. I I wish we had a big church right now in uh, so everybody could shout, amen, get up and start running because that is so true. Mm. That is so true. You know, the thing that makes my head explode about America's current condition and especially the church, which is still asleep, 
uh, is this is such a preventable crisis. It's, yes. it, it can be stopped. And Azusa Street, as you said, it, it evolved actually into a worldwide movement. God didn't That's want right. it to stay in L.A. And it's, it's the greatest revival or outpouring of the spirit in the history of the church. There's no doubt about it. You can compare it to what happened in, in Cane Ridge or in the prayer revival in the 1850s in New York, or even the Welsh revival, which inspired Azusa Street. That's right. But none of those did what Azusa Street did. Create a worldwide movement that 100 years later is still going. And there are now 650 million Pentecostals in the world. And Say that, Mark. You know, so we, we gotta, we've got to go in deeper now. We're going to go in deeper now. And, and I'm going to ask you to get ready for a question about signs and wonders. Mm -hmm. Because at Berkeley, I couldn't reach the intellectual atheists and the radical leftists until the sick began to be healed. You also saw on the campus the same miracle power, and you see it in your meetings now. God uses you supernaturally. And we're going to talk about that, And uh, but I'm going to do a little short, brief announcement to the audience, and then we're going to jump on this. Uh, people wonder why we offer books to people. And uh, I want to tell you, John Wesley said, and later on we're also going to mention uh, Sean Smith's book, because it's one you got to read. Uh, we read something that John Wesley said, never go to a church or a meeting without books that are going to help people. I don't believe in merchandise. I don't believe in commercialism, but I do believe that the Lord leads men to write books. And I wrote three of them. One of them is called uh, Edgewise. The other is called Critical Mass, and the new one, which I'm really humbled by what it is doing worldwide, is Vessels of Fire and Glory. Now, this year began, I'm going to talk real fast, this year began with the Lord telling me not to receive offerings for our ministry because we weren't having 10 crusades. Even in our monthly letter, I told people, if you give, it's only for our day-to-day -day expenses, I'm not going to make an appeal. And then the Lord said, keep your whole staff on full salary and don't, don't let the inability to receive offerings in churches and crusades stop you. And so I obeyed the Lord, but I said, I need an idea, Lord, that's win-win. And there it is. When uh, It's called the War Chest Collection, three of our most important books. And for $27, you not only fill our war chest, but at the same time, you get three books and I even autographed Vessels of Fire and Glory. And you can just go to the mariobarillo.org and, and get this. And that's, that's really what I want to say is you're helping us with our war chest. Now, I want to get to Acts 14.3. One of the things that was so amazing when I, you came and preached in our, one of our rallies is you quoted... Acts 14.3, which if people would obey this, by the way, uh, it, it is a strange verse because in verse one, it says all hell broke loose and their lives were threatened and the, the, the culture turned on them. And it said, nevertheless, they stayed there a long time. I don't believe we should give up on San Francisco. I don't believe we should let Oakland go. I don't believe that we should let New York City or the cities that we are quote unquote anti-Christian or they're bastions of liberalism. I believe God can work there. Nevertheless, it's got to get back in us. And that, that's the thing I love about you is you're still going on the front line. You're still going to where it isn't safe. You're, and you know, every Sunday night, Robbie Dawkins and I, we have Sunday night church. And I we love talk it. about that. You know, we talk about that all the time, this this need for safety. And I, and I blame the preaching of the last 20 years because it taught entitlement. It made, uh, it made the Christian the center of the universe instead of Christ. And, and service and serving God and following after God. But mm. the supernatural is the key to healing the race problem of the United States. Here's what we need, folks. Meetings where wheelchairs are empty. Blind eyes are open 
in the name of Jesus. Mm. Now, here is the part of that verse that I'm taking too long to get to. Nevertheless, they stayed there a long time, preaching boldly, and the Lord proved their message was from him by giving them power to do great miracles. You know, in cancel culture, and this is the question I'm going to ask you. In cancel culture, there is a belief of many preachers that we have to tone down our distinctives of hell, the blood, the cross, the second coming of Christ, mm. because it's going to be offensive and we might be canceled. Someone might get on social media and, and reveal our personal information. We might be persecuted. But you know one thing? Nobody can discount a true miracle. When a blind eye opens, when a hopeless disease vanishes, all bets are off. The conversation is over. When God drops the miracle card, the debate ends. Come now, on. They dispute it. But the fact is, that's what we need now. And, if, right. and, and this is what Christians have got to come to, Sean. They've got to come to the point where they understand, do you really want to get rid of abortion? Do you really want to get rid of racism? Do you truly, sincerely, after all this spouting and pontificating and all of this getting in our ramparts and trying to hold the moral high ground, do we really want America to turn around? Then we've got to get with God and say, help me to pay the price to operate in supernatural healing power. That's what's got to happen. So Come now- on. Tell us about it. I'll say this. What you're saying is so accurate, Mario. You're getting me fired up as you always Good. can. You, you remember that scene in that original Raiders of the Lost Ark where this dude has his big old machete. He's coming out doing all this kind of stuff. He's going to take out Indiana Jones. Indiana Jones looks down. You're thinking, uh-oh, this dude's going to have to fight this guy. And he pulls out a gun and just shoots the guy. Right. I kind of feel like the church has the gun of signs and wonders and miracles and we're letting the devil carve us up with a butter knife. Like it's time for us to reach for what has always been the most significant earth shattering, revolutionary Period. dynamic ever known to earth. It's the kingdom of God released. When I was on the college campus, I kind of was thrusted uh, into the, the leadership of our campus ministry. Cause after the founder of our ministry, which was a phenomenal man of God, a great friend of, of both of ours uh, that's with the Lord, uh, there was a, another guy that took over and he had to, he had to step down. No, no, it wasn't a situation he did. It was something that happened to his wife. And so I'm interning in ministry. So I'm thrusted in this. And so I'm all of a sudden coming after, in a sense, uh, a bit of a moral failure. I'm leading as a, as an intern. I'm kind of having to preach and I'm like, oh my God, I'm scared. I start praying. I'm like, oh my God, I'm not very confident in speaking in front of people. I got a D plus in high school speech. And all of a sudden in our meeting, there was a gal that came by the name of Becky. Becky couldn't talk. So she was mute. And it was, it was, she was in a special class. She had to write notes. She could hear. She couldn't talk. People knew that. People knew Becky because she's the sweetest gal, but she'd have to, you'd have to stop and she'd have to write a note. She comes out to our meeting because a friend invites her. Uh, she hears the message. She comes forward. Uh, I had been introduced to her, but I, I was not cluing in. This, this was Becky that couldn't talk. And so I'm, I'm at the altar praying, people were getting saved. I put my hand on her back and I said, what's your name? What, what can I pray with you about? And she goes, my name is Becky. And like, I'm mic'd up and like, I forgot who she is. I'm seeing all these students around hit the floor. And like, people are like, oh my God. And then she grabs her mouth and she says again, my name is Becky. We're, it's a whirlwind, man. So many, first of all, she was leading people to the Lord with a hello. <laughs> she was, everybody was waiting for her to write on a piece of paper. She go, hi. She says, you need to come to this meeting because Jesus can set you free. And so we had a, like an outbreak of souls being saved. We were whisk, great friend of yours. We were on family Christian broadcasting television within 48 hours. She's sharing her testimony. And all of a sudden this thing broke out. Well, I just say, I could have had the greatest communication uh, you know, in terms of how we think I could have given a TED talk, but more than a TED talk is to let Jesus walk. And man, let me tell you what Jesus walks among you, signs and wonders. And what I love about this is I wasn't even praying for her to get healed. I was just in that moment desperate. And I kind of feel like 
no doubt we want to pray in form prayers, but I think maybe the biggest thing right now is maybe this whole crisis, the crisis and the racial divide right. crisis is God saying, church, you got to get desperate. If my people yeah. call by my name, as much as I pray for our government and people and authorities in Romans 13, I recognize that the real control command center of America is the church. It's the prayer room. It's, it's man, people on their face. It's if my people are called by my name. And that miracle begin to open a door. And I got to share one quick one. Oh, you you Yours, got time. You got to go, man. Go. Your, well, okay, two quick ones. One was I went to your meeting at the Henry J. Kaiser Auditorium in Oakland. You called out a woman in a wheelchair, precious Asian lady, could not walk, yeah. hadn't walked for years, paralyzed. You called her out. At first, she doesn't move. We would later find out, I'm in the meeting with a friend of mine. We drove up the students because she doesn't understand English. So you said, Usher, would you please help me? The power of God is on this woman. Usher comes behind her, puts his hands on her. She jumps up. Her little shawl falls off her lap. She starts running around. Yep. People go crazy. I hit my face. And, and this is the thing. I'm jealous for a generation to know that we have a Jesus that does that. I think we've seen the overextension of, of, of certain preachers that don't feel like they, it's time to pull out their gun and they're letting the devil carve them up. And they've been reduced to this kind of programmatic kind of like put a timer up on the on the pulpit because I got to be finished in 22 minutes and a 22 minute sermon creates a 22 minute Christian. We need yes. somebody that's been in the Preach. Holy Ghost room and has had some time. And I'll tell you this one final one because I think this miracle is credible. And ironically, here's the deal. In each of these situations, when the miracle of God fell, no one's pointing at another race in the room and going, you're a different color, no. you're a different color. No. In that moment, it's like supernatural. It's a, it's a it's an ecosystem of glory that brings this bond that you and I have just seen something together. They say like if you want to take a girl and you're trying to impress her, if you can take her on a roller coaster ride, and then the endorphins and the adrenaline rush, and she'll make the connection. There, that that is a cheap natural substitute of when you and someone else share a miracle moment of what God happen, does. I'm I'm in New Jersey area. Lord speaks to me and says, he's doing a miracle in the daughters of Chuck. Like, think about that. Like, I'm, I'm wrestling in my head. Nobody calls themselves Chuck anymore. Very few, I should say. Daughters of Chucks, I call it out. Well, there were two ladies there, daughters of Chuck, grown women. Lord directed me to minister over one. The other one was out in the foyer because I would later find out when she, she's younger, she was in college. Someone from the second story of a dorm drops an ice chest on her head. Like it knocks her out. She has these thick glasses. She gets uh, she gets severe headaches. She gets nausea. She can't hardly walk. She can't. Her whole life is shutting down. Basically, she's just sitting in a dark room with these dark glasses on. She doesn't even come in when that word comes. She waits till everyone leaves. So she walks up, pray for this precious girl that has had this serious condition. Doctors are pretty much just saying, hey, just, here's meds because there's nothing we can do about this. We prayed for her right there on the spot. I come back a year later, she's holding hands with a guy. She's engaged. She says that right after that moment, that whatever this kitchen condition was, there's a name for it, all dizziness left, all severe headaches left. She began to be able to run around before she could even watch tennis because it would, it, it would literally throw off her equilibrium and she would get this vertigo thing that would just, any severe, and, I mean, her quality of life was nil. And she is now playing tennis. She's happily married. One miracle gave this girl her life back. And it's still a word, daughters of Chuck. And so I'm saying, <laughs> man, it's not time to bind the Holy Ghost and help him no. to the back room and pull him out on a Wednesday Come night off. small group because we're afraid to let the Holy Ghost go on a Sunday morning. Let me tell you what, you're in heaven church if the Holy Spirit isn't let loose. This is exactly what America needs. And so I just think, I, I, I shudder to think that if we would have just did this little kind of, well, you know, we hope you get better. And man, here's some humanistic thoughts. And, you know, we, we cannot reduce this glorious gospel to some sound bites and, and just think that that's the deal. And, and man, I love the miracle power of God, Mario. Yeah, my friend, I'm going to tell you uh, something. Sean, do you know why the conversation about race, left, right, conservative, political, is suddenly shattered. You know, uh, tic-tac-toe is a game you can't win. If you win, it's because the other person made a mistake. And, and so it's, it's futility. 
And the conversation of you did me wrong, so now I want you to know I'm going to do you wrong, and we're just going to keep this vicious cycle. Why does the supernatural change that? And the answer is so simple, it's amazing we overlooked it because it deals with the devil. Mm. The, the, the miracles of Christ break the power of the devil. And as I said about that hand puppet thing, everybody's right in their own eyes. All Everyone has run to their own way. Everybody's correct. Everyone can, can recant and recite their idealism and, and reject the other side. Right now, if you're a Republican, you can't accept any arguments from the Democrat side, or that we're, it's total polarity. If you're a Democrat, you cannot. You, you've got to be woke and you've got to cancel everybody. But here comes the power of Christ into that situation. And why does it work? Because it turns off the power of the devil. Jesus went about, Acts 10, 38, Jesus went about doing good, healing all who are oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. Now, we come to the most important part of this entire interview, my friend. You wrote a book that is a watershed book. It is a mm. breakthrough book. It is a game changer, and, and it introduces a very important thought. The name of your book is I Am Your Sign. But the story yes. behind this book is uh, amazing. Please tell the people uh, the story, the supernatural encounter you had. I was in uh, uh, Monterey, California. Anybody from California knows that Monterey is very much kind of a new age Mecca down by yeah. Carmel, beautiful city. Finished the church service in the morning, was going to, uh, having lunch, was going to go back Sunday night to do an evening service. We're walking down with the pastor and his wife passing some shops. And I walked past this shop. It was a new age bookstore. But the moment I walked past the shop, I felt this like heavy uh, oppression. I mm -hmm. mean, I could tell there was something demonic going on. I take a couple further steps. I look and I could see that standing in front of the store, uh, the store, the New Age bookstore, I wouldn't have been able to see it. But by taking a couple steps, I was very close to this actual New Ager who was doing tarot card readings live. And so I, I, I continually, I kind of stretch my hands forward. I pray, Lord, deliver that lady, save them people in there, get back to the car. And, and like the Lord says, ah, oh, son, that, that's no drive-by intercessory moves. I need you on site, you know, on demand. And so I go in the store. I don't even know, Mario, what I'm supposed to say or do. I'm in this store. And, and so I, I knew all, I, the conversation was going to begin with the lady who is a, a, a new age guru there. So I said, hey, can I have a word with you? I don't even know what I'm gonna say. She says, hey, just give me a minute. Let me finish this reading. So I walk around the store. I, I, I stop over this uh, bargain table and, and this is the Lord. There was a bargain table of books and it said, the idiot's guide to tarot card reading. And I go, yeah, yeah, that's right. You gotta be an idiot to believe this stuff. And in that moment, I, I got this total download. I immediately knew, number one, God says, I want you to walk up to this lady and say, I am your son. Number two, she had a bad uh, experience with church when she was young. She ended up moving in the Eastern guru that she thought was going to nurture her. Instead, he ended up abusing her. She got thrusted out. This is all she thought she could do and be. And number three, ever since she was a little girl, she had a dream. God didn't show me what the dream was. She had a dream. She doesn't think she could fulfill the dream. So right now she's doing what she's doing by default. Tell her if she lets go of the default, I'll give her her dream back. This now, let me ask you something. Yeah, yeah. Because I, so many times when people give testimonies, we skirt right by it. You mean to tell me, I mean, in front of thousands who are watching right now, that you literally got those, that list of detailed facts about her. And for no reason that you're aware of, you're to say the phrase, I am your sign. That's right. This, now, what's the mathematical probability of one of those things being true? But all right. four... There, there's no computer. There's no, there's no way to calculate. No. And, and so that absolutely has got me like, if, if I heard this for the first time, and I've heard it many times, I would be sitting on the edge of my seat right now going, and then what happened? <laughs> <laughs> You're, awesome. You're awesome, Mario. And so, you know, in that moment, it, it, it's really, and this is what I like to say, you could be on the right side or the wrong side of what if. I think so many people right now, they're going, what if racism does this? What if the economy does it? What if the other 
party uh, secures the White House? What if? You're on the wrong side of what if. What if God chooses this moment to release the greatest ingathering of souls the nations of the world has ever seen? What if right on the other side of this consternation we feel as a people that God has literally chosen to use this to turn it into an awakening that we go from woke to awake? Like, what if? Let's be on the right side of what? So I'm like, what if I'm wrong? But what the other side is, what if I'm right? What do I have to lose? Let me step out. So obviously, I don't walk up to women I don't know and go, I am your side. You know, like, that's <laughs> not going to work, right? I mean, it didn't. So one of the things I at least knew, I knew it, it's not coming from me. Because when you hear the voice of God, there's something altogether other about it, but there's something totally familiar about it. So it's this real space where it's going, is it me? But if it is, it's the most profound, clear thought I've ever had. And I feel this presence, like I feel faith on this. And so I think it was Dave Wilkerson said in his newsletter, The Voice of God, God doesn't speak apart from his presence. So you feel the presence, it has a weight on it. So I walk over to the lady and I go, uh, hey, I'm a follower of Christ. Uh, actually, I first asked her, I said, how do these cards get you in touch with the spirit realm? I felt if I sowed listening to her, she'd sow listening back. She told me how the tarot card, she went through this long litany of stuff that was pretty far-fetched to believe. I said, can I share with you how I get in touch with the spirit realm? She says, yes. I said, there, there are two doors and the other door might as well be marked other. Because if you don't walk through a door with a relationship with Jesus Christ through, through that door, all other doors will close on you. They look great on the outside, but it ends up imprisoning your soul at the end of the day. And so she backs up. So if that's all I had, Mario, I submit to you, it's an old school pinball machine, tilt, game over everything. But this is where the supernatural all of a sudden can change the most hardened heart. Here's a woman. She's not in church. She's she's a practicing Wiccan at a new age bookstore in Monterey, California. Hello, yep. somebody. Talking about a tender shoot breaking forth out of dry ground. And so she's there. And so I said, well, but can I share with you what God said to me about you? And so she leads in. She wants to hear God. I said, Lord, I wanted me to tell you I am your sign. She turns, she leans her head back, turns her head away from me, and I could see she's starting to tear up. And so I went, okay, this is good. I said, number two, the Lord showed me you had a bad experience with church. You end up moving over the Eastern guru you thought was going to nurture you, but instead he ended up abusing you. Yes, she's fully crying. I said, the Lord says you're doing this thing, reading tarot cards by default. But when you were a little girl, you had a dream. This is not what you dreamt that you would do or be when you're a grown woman. Whoa. God says, if you let go of the default, you'll get your dream because God is in a restoring dream. She fully is crying. She has a long line of people in line to get a, a, a reading from her. She says, how did you know? I mean, check miss, you know, I'm gonna project my chi into the collective conscience of the universe and the accurate secrets of the cards can accurately <laughs> predict your future. She said, how did you know? I said, Jesus. And she says, last night I cried out to the cosmos, give me a sign. So the word I am your sign was God interrupting her plea to the cosmos. She's crying out to a new age deity to answer it. And God is saying, no, 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 no. I'm not gonna let the devil rob you. I, I'll pursue you like that. I'll send this African-American man off the street into this new age bookstore to let you know that I am the one who's gonna answer that prayer. She says, that blew me away. She says, when I was a young girl, I had a bad experience in church, moved in with an Eastern guru. He sexually abused me, physically abused me. Uh, uh, verbally, emotionally abused me. That's why she started crying. She says, ever since I was a little girl, I always wanted to paint as in art, but I never thought I could pay the bills, uh, even though I've got a bunch of paintings sitting back in my apartment. <clears throat> and so I've been reading tarot cards because that's the only thing that guy, I got out of the relationship with that guy. But right now, it just doesn't feel like this is what I should be doing. And I say, you know what? You shouldn't. And let me tell you what you should do right now. Jesus sent me here because he loved you. You need to give your life to Christ. So we grab hands on this little kind of tabletop thing with a black cloth on it with a tarot card spread out. We grab hands. She prays the sinner's prayer. She renounces Wiccan. She says, she says, I'm not going to do this anymore. She gets up from the table, walks to the counter, Mario, gets her last paycheck, and then asks me, do you know a good church I could go to? She says, I'm going to step out and begin to paint because that's the dream my God has given back to me. Like, Oh my God, like without the supernatural, none of that happens. That's God is doing that every day. And there's this verse, Isaiah 53, you're very familiar with it. It speaks of Jesus and it says he was a tender shoot out of dry ground. Dry ground is neither the opt optimal ingredients in terms of the soil, 
nor right. the, the proper circumstance in terms of how dry it is and hard it is for a tender shoot. So what it's saying, and, and this is a Mario, Mario Murilloism, is that revivals are most likely when they're least likely. Jesus yeah. is the great reviver. And what if everything that we've gone through is because on the other side of this, and, and I almost don't like to use this term, but I think people would get it quicker. Right. Even to do it, but it's because Jesus. But I've seen so many people because in this, they're looking for anchor points and they're not finding any. And the true anchor point that what happened to that woman in that uh, New Age bookstore uh, in this moment, that in this hard, dry place, a tender shoot of faith can break forth in a moment in your heart and turn everything around because that, that blade of whatever plant it was, it's a holy plant. It doesn't need to pull anything out of your life. In fact, it comes to bring something to your life. And that was the miracle of that tender shoot coming out of dry ground. Herod was killing babies. It was hard environment. And yet there was a woman at the temple named Anna. Uh, Josephus uh, yes. was kind of inaccurate when he said God hadn't spoke for 400 years. Well, somewhere in that 400 years, he spoke to this woman because she knew that, man, if she would pray that a tender shoot would break forth out of dry ground. I believe that there is a remnant of believers that have held on. And, man, we are about to see God roll up his redemptive sleeves and release. I'm convinced a flurry of signs and wonders and people you never thought you'd get saved are about to get saved and even more so in the backdrop of the dry ground of, of the racism and virulence that we're seeing. You know, this is such a powerful moment, uh, Sean. What you've just shared has gone out with a powerful anointing on it. And I'll bet there are people watching right now that would give anything to have an experience like you did with that lady that was a tarot card reader who was remarkably saved. But in order for you to do that, you need training. You need right. instruction. And that's why I think God led you to write that book, I Am Your Sign. Because I really want to pose this to the crowd, to the audience. How would you like to have something like that happen to you? How would you like to have a gift of God talking to you about other people you don't even know or that you do know? And I think that's why you need to get this book. You need to read it. You need to pray over it. That book needs to get in your hands. How do they get it, Sean? Because they need to get it. They can go to our, our website, uh, seansmithministries.com or pointblankinternational.org. And the book, I Am Your Sign, I wrote it about revival. I wrote it about signs and wonders. I, I, I wrote it. There's history in it, but I love to tell people it's not written so much about history, but written to those who will make history. And yeah. uh, I, I feel like we have drunk on the devil's bottle of despair long enough. We've allowed this pes pes pessimism to yeah. put us on the wrong side of the what if. Yeah. And so this book, I believe, uh, will spark you. And, and, and I've read your book, Critical Mass, that you were offering, and you gave me a bunch. I gave them out to college students. And when they got a hold of that thing of revival, I just saw people, uh, as the kids would say, they got lit. And, and I'm, I'm praying that this book will do the same for this generation as well. Well, I, I, I can't uh, recommend it any more strongly. And you saw the uh, website address down there. Go there and, and don't just buy a book. There's a donation page there, and you can be a partner in a very powerful, powerful ministry. Sean and his wife, Krista, are prophetic. They're both. They both operate in the supernatural. And, uh, and Sean will tell you because he's, he's biased toward it, but Krista has a unique gift in the power of the Spirit. And when they're oh teamed up together, it's, uh, it's a pretty stunning thing to watch. And, I, and they deserve, of course, in this, this time. Now, I want to say something on a personal note. And we're not done yet, by the way. So uh, you, you folks just relax. You know, uh, I was with Trinity Broadcasting Network in the early days when they began. They were actually in a storage bin in one of those uh, spaces you could rent uh, to store things. And they put up a bed sheet for a backdrop. They had one light, two folding chairs. And Paul Crouch would operate the camera while Jan would interview me. 
And then Jan would run the camera when Paul was interviewing me. And that's how back, far back I go with Trinity Broadcasting wow. Network. I was on that network for 27 years. And let me tell you, in the early days, the part I loved the most is when the hour was up, Paul would look at me and say, Mario, the spirit of God is moving too strong. God gave us this network, so we're not going off the air just because it's time. Folks, we're going on into overtime. And we may do that today because I think what we're doing is far too important to look at the clock. But on a personal note, and, and, and Sean, I'm going to have you share in a minute. I was winning souls. Sean will tell you, he's been to our meetings. I, I'm, I give altar calls. I, I preach the straight gospel. I've never backed down. I learned a long time ago never to compromise, that you'll outlive your enemies and you won't, you won't be canceled. If you stand your ground, you draw a line in the sand and you refuse to ever compromise. And that's why I'm still alive. But I was never politically involved. And the Bible tells us about a prophet named Amos, who one day, he said, I'm not a prophet nor the son of a prophet, but one day the Lord told me to go over to the king of Israel and prophesy right under his bed, the window to his bedroom. And the Lord spoke to me one day, Sean, and he said, I want you to start writing a blog. And I'm telling you, that was torture. I said, what? He said, yeah, and I want you to try to write one every day. Well, that uh, that has now gone over 10 million views. A couple mm. thousand Christian leaders a day read it. And we've been approached by some heavyweights asking for use of the material that God allowed me to write. I'm going back to what I was before, just like Amos. I'm on assignment. When the Lord told me to write that blog, you know what happened, Sean? I said, uh, why? He said, I told someone else to do it. And they said, no. Wow. And so, I wonder how many people God told to go and witness to that lady reading the tarot cards. And they said, no. That's good. And he yeah. said, yes. And that's what released the miracles. Someday I may, and I, I'll announce this probably around November, I'm going back to being a straight up crusade evangelist. I'm going to go on a manhunt nationwide. As soon as the doors reopen, I'm doing it online. You are doing it online, but I'm going back because nothing in the world is more thrilling than that moment I'm sitting in my tent and it's wall to wall people and all of a sudden miracles break out. When God slams one door shut, the, you know, he opens up another one. When the devil tries to nail a door shut, God blasts another one open. I had to change. And the way I changed was we're going to document these miracles and we're going to document the moment when they happen. And we're going to put them out on the internet so that the world in one, this is what God did for me by wow. keeping, he should never have let Mario Murillo stay in his house, the devil, and the devil never should have put Paul in prison because he invented a new weapon called the New Testament and billions of people were impacted by it. That's what God is doing is creating new weapons. Now, Sean, mm. I really want you to look into this, camera and just tell the body of Christ to, you know, we need to wake up, don't we, brother? We need to wake up, quit fearing, quit being divided. And, and there is a death you go through right before a service. Mm -hmm. And you know, you're going to, you've told people they're going to come and get healed. So just look in the camera and exhort the people, brother, because it's on you right now. Yes. You know, Jesus says, behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Therefore, be shrewd as serpents and innocent as doves. And I'm, I'm thinking, I remember thinking, man, if I'm Peter, I'm like, I understand a little bit about the food chain, Lord Jesus. It, shouldn't you say you send us out as wolves in the midst of sheep? Because sheep are on the lower end of the food chain. And what Jesus is saying is saying, I'm going to deliberately put you in where you are the underdog. You have a mismatch because you're gonna do this by stepping out in the area of faith. But faith all of a sudden puts you in a place where you have this retractor beam, you know, the old, 
I think it was a guy, I think the guy's name was E.E. E. Smith, and he invented in 1931 the fictitious retractor beam that later was shortened to tractor beam. It's his mothership or, you know, whether it's the USS Enterprise, Star Trek, Star Wars, it locks coordinates and pulls you in. I feel like your destiny in God locks a coordinate on you and begins to pull you in yes. to where God has you. And the best place to find you is when you put yourself in the midst because what are wolves there? It's marketplace resistance. But what does Jesus promise? He says, all this will be done as a testimony, but he says, do not worry beforehand what you will say, but it will be your father in that moment who will give you what to say. The secret to prophetic evangelism is being willing to be a sheep in the midst of wolves. That right now there are hungry hearts and people that are, are tired of being misdirected, that they're being told this and that. It's like their life has become this ping pong game between watching what they're telling you and everything else and the situation of violence. And there are people that have gotten so hopeless in this time where the absolute bottom has fallen out, much like my story, if you've heard it. But there's good news right now that, I, I, and I love this phrase, that there's never been a good time to be without Jesus, but there's never been a worse time than right now to go without Jesus. And in this moment, those Say. who don't know the Lord, that in this moment, God is using this season to direct you towards your greatest destiny. That it's not just about getting you safe and immune from a disease. It's not just about you not having to worry about going to your favorite shop or restaurant and eating indoors. This is far greater than that. What God wants to give you absolutely is life itself and life everlasting. And he wants to give you, I love Mario, you said this, he gives you heaven to go to heaven on. And at the same point in time, believers, you gotta recognize the moment. It's not the time to get back and get caught in pettiness and go back and forth and be thumb thugs on Facebook because you didn't like what someone posts. What you've been given is a power and a, and a majestic gospel far more in this moment uh, potent than what you can kind of thumb in terms of an argument going back and forth. It's ability to be a sheep in the midst of wolves and have Jesus give you what to say. And in that moment, you become a testimony. And I love in that passage, the testimony wasn't just in front of synagogues. It says you'd be brought in front of magistrates, you'd be brought in front of rulers and councils. That I believe that God has ordained a witness that will go literally to the seven mountains, to the marketplace, yes. to, to Google, to Facebook, to Amazon, yes. to your neighbor. And, and if we will say yes in this moment, on the other side of your yes, is I'm convinced the greatest outpouring that God is that God has ever released on planet Earth. It's now. We don't have to wait. It's not four more months, then come to harvest. It's now, this moment. And um, what we're going to do in a moment, folks, is we're going to pray. We're going to say one last prayer. And uh, I want to just kind of finish a little bit here. I want to do, Mark. I want to reinforce that you go to the uh, Sean's website and get a copy of that book, I Am Your Sign. And uh, there is the website address on the screen right now. And again, don't just buy the book. Donate something, a love offering. God will multiply it back to you. And give to Sean and Krista's ministry, which is not only setting churches on fire, but winning the lost, winning youth. And uh, it's a powerful ministry that deserves your, your offering. And I would love nothing better than to get a report of a huge amount of love that was shared with this wonderful ministry of Sean and Krista. And there's a picture of Krista right there. Uh, so we're, we're going to do this now. Church in America, listen to me. There's a lot being said right now about... Why didn't the, and it's true that a lot, there was a sprinkling here and there, but the preponderance of messages last November and December were about 2020 being this great year of multiplication and everything was going to be great. It was going to be a banner year and it couldn't be better. So a lot of cynical Christians have said, well, if the prophetic gift is so real, why did they miss it? Well, here's a chilling possible answer. What if we're in the warning now? And don't you find it a little bit odd that you're willing to make fun of the inaccuracy of what they were saying in November, 
but you are now not listening to the warnings that are going on. We are warning you now that what if to something else, what if this is a prelude to something really, really big? And mm. let's say many of you don't like Trump and you think, well, I'm, well, David sinned. He took a census and God gave him some hard choices. And you really believe that we aren't right now with a president that is rough, who tweets, who is, you know, rude and brash, and he, he upsets your sensibilities. I know what's wrong with you. You just never met anyone from New York City before. And I'm going to tell you what, we lost our right to a gentle answer. We gave it up. We built churches based on big screens, skinny jeans, and fog machines told the Holy Spirit to leave. And now we've been left with a hard choice between a Democrat party that has sold its soul to atheism, sold its very life's blood to an agenda of uh, Bernie Sanders, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, and made it very clear, undeniable, we're going to continue the right of mass human sacrifice. Yeah. We're going to honor the ideas and the ideals. And I believe that many of these radicals, they are the armed militia of the Democrat Party. You have to say that's what they are, because otherwise they would have stopped them. Now, the body of Christ needs to understand a sober moment. We are at the moment when God is asking the church to repent and return to her first love. I am your sign. I'm your sign that you need to quit playing games. We, we thought it would be over by now, and it hasn't been over. And it's also interesting that two things are going on. There is no clear national repentance. Now, why hasn't it occurred to us? to fall before God in mass and say, what are we doing wrong? What are we saying wrong? When pastors can't even get in the pulpit, when Christians are afraid to witness and they wonder, how is this nation? Your kids are being indoctrinated. Minorities are being sold another delay of their dream. The dream of Dr. King is being delayed one more generation by Black Lives Matter. It's time for the power of God to move. Now let's, let's agree in prayer right now, Sean. Let's agree in yes. prayer. And before we pray, is there something on your heart you want to conclude with? I don't want to, I, I, I felt to say what I just said, but, but I, I want to know if there's anything you want to add. No, let's pray. That, that was profound. I love what you said. What if, you know, sometimes when the outer world matches our inner world, when there's this bankruptness that we see around us in the outward world in terms of a lack of answers, and it meets this internal place of a lack of answers, that's when the real answer can come. It's a generation that crying for justice. The ultimate justice is that what Jesus died on the cross and paid for, he'd get, and that's your heart, and that's your life, and you're, you're better for it. I'm proof of that. Mario's proof of that. 
and you will be the first fruits of an amazing new Jesus people movement. And I, and I believe that, you know, so many people say, well, I don't, I, I've seen hypocrites in church. I've seen, hey, truth be told, I, I've gone to dentists and doctors. I've had legal <laughs> defense. Hey, there are hypocrites everywhere, but that doesn't keep you from going to the real one. When you need a root canal, you're going to find that right dentist. And I'm telling you right now, there, there are awesome churches around, but the first thing you got to do is come to Jesus. And so Mario, like, like I'm so with whatever you're saying. I'm, I'm shouting. I feel the presence of God. He's here, man. Lead people to Jesus, brother. Yes. It's you're watching right now. Receive Christ right now because you're a yes. soul winner. Amen. You're watching right now. You don't delay this. When you recognize this a moment, you don't allow another moment. A, a point of delay right now lets the devil know he can, he can thrash your life that much longer. You don't wait. This is your now. Now is the time of salvation. I want you to pray this prayer. And this prayer is very simple. When you ask Jesus to come into your heart and life, he answers that prayer. He's immediately there with you. There's no shelter in place when it comes to the love of God. He can meet you. You can have a peace where you're sleeping at night. You don't need those pills any longer. The peace he gives you will allow you to rest and get up rested. And so right now, let's just pray this prayer. If you're here right now, I just want to pray. Father, I just pray for those that are watching right now. And there are those right now that have never made you Lord of their life. And I believe there are many that have walked away from the Lord. They got hurt. They got wounded. They got sidetracked. But right now, Jesus, you're there for them. And Lord, right now, I just pray that as they open their mouth and open their heart and say, Jesus, come into my life. I repent of my sins. Lord, I ask you to take my hurt and my woundedness and turn it into the miracle of what you have always, always do. When you come on the scene, life replaces death. Yes. Hope replaces despair. Freedom replaces bondage. Yes. And we pray that over people right now. Yes. And Lord, I thank you that as we confess you with our mouth as Lord and place our faith upon you, the Lord lets us know something supernatural. There's a miracle in that moment that is the greatest miracle of all. And I thank you, God, that we are no longer, maybe in my instance, uh, illegitimate child, a child raised by an alcoholic and all those other things. In that moment, I become this thing the Bible calls a new creation where all of a sudden the DNA...